Jim Haslam, attorney. I do Elder Law, estate planning, and special needs planning. My topic for tonight is a wonderful one that they say, Medicare and Social Security. It is something that is near and dear to a lot of people's hearts that they rely upon Social Security, of course, for income purposes and Medicare for health insurance. But there are a lot of different components of it, and my job is to help make you understand a little bit more. The way they ask us to structure this tonight is, of course, please, if you have questions, please hold them until after the session. They run about 20 minutes. Let me know your questions. Happy to answer. But after I'm talking, Shalomo and Ari are going to talk about long-term care insurance and other topics, so we have to give you respect for each other's clients. Now, tonight is learning about the program. It's not an in-depth everything you need to know. The main thing I can say to someone on these topics, the government does a phenomenal job with SSA.gov for Social Security Administration.gov and Medicare.gov. A lot of resources they have to deal with. Anyway, so my topic, Medicare insurance. We're talking about various laws that are out here. And remember, anything can change. So what is Medicare? It is a health insurance program. Everyone needs health insurance. Well, this one was designed in 1965 dealing with seniors, people age 65 and older, also people end-stage liver, renal disease, and also certain disabilities administered by the government. There are general four parts that we're going to talk about. Part A, B, C, and D. We're going to talk about those parts as we go along. What is Part A? A little more in depth, but you get Part A of the insurance very simply by having your Social Security benefits, which means you had to have worked at least 40 quarters, which is 10 straight years of service. You start rolling in Medicare, they send you a package three months beforehand. Medicare does start earlier, though, for people who are disabled. When you get Medicare, you get that beautiful red, white, and blue card. It is your admission, it is your ticket that if you go to any facility, any physician that works under the Medicare program, they know that you're there and you can get services. On the card, very important, if you see in the front, it says there's hospital and medical, part A, part B. Not everyone is going to use those programs. We'll talk about it as we go on. So general enrollment. People who get enrolled every year between January to March. The coverage is effective of July 1. It's the general enrollment so you can be on Medicare into the future year when you're age 65 and older. There are penalties that if someone chooses not to apply when they're supposed to, the actual cost of being on Medicare can go higher than what you normally would pay. So what does it cover? Let's talk about Part A and Part B. Part A, the easiest way to say it, is your intensive hospitalization and nursing home care, rehabilitative care. We'll go more into that in a little bit. But one, inpatient. You get ill, you go into a hospital. There has to be something called the spell of illness. You're in the facility, it may be an emergency room, you may be admitted to the facility, you may be there for observation status, and it's very important to understand the differences. But when you go in, Medicare is going to cover you. And there are various periods, the day 1 to 60, 60 to 90, and 60 reserve days. Talk a little bit more in the future. Skilled nursing care. People go, this is great. Medicare covers skilled nursing care. But the problem is, people do not always understand that Medicare is not Medicaid. Medicare is designed for primary coverage, rehabilitative coverage, and it's limited. Medicaid is designed for long-term skilled and custodial care. There's another um, seminar going on at this time on those topics, and in the next session, if you want, we'll learn about the Medicaid program. We're here, we're learning about Medicare. But at most, in a skilled nursing facility, you have up to 100 days of coverage. We'll go into a little bit more. There's limited home health services when there is a skilled care component with it. There is hospice, there is blood, and there are benefit periods. So say before you walk into a hospital, there's an initial 60-day period, and you're paying a deductible $1,260. That is a one-time fee to cover those 60 days. But when you're covering 
those days. The question is who's going to cover it, and we'll talk in a little bit about supplemental Medicare insurances. Now, if you're in the hospital, we see day one to 60, it's one deductible. But if you're staying from after day 60, day 61 to 90, it's costing you $315 a day. If you've exhausted the first 90, and you go to days 91 to 150, that's called the reserve day. Important distinction that people don't always realize from it. The day 1 to 60 and 61 to 90, these can always regenerate. That if you're out of hospital, you're out of a nursing facility for a minimum of 60 days, and then you go back to a hospital, you can regenerate back to day 1 if you go back to a hospital. But the lifetime reserve days, you get 60 for your lifetime. You use it, you never get it back. And the only time you can tap into your reserve days is if you've exceeded the night. Who's going to cover these costs? That's Medicare Supplemental Insurance. Hang on a little bit in the program. To get into the nursing home coverage, it's not an automatic. People presume because it's there under Medicare Part A that you automatically get the skilled nursing home coverage. It's not true. You have to have what's called a minimum three-day hospitalization in order to have coverage in a facility. And when you leave the hospital, you need to have some level of skilled care. It could be nursing coverage. It could be therapeutic, such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. You could have a feeding tube, but some level of skilled care in order to get Medicare to cover you. And at any point during those 100 days, Medicare can terminate if you do not need the skilled care services any longer. What's covered in a skilled nursing facility? As you might guess, the room, the board, meals, all the fun activities that you can go to, your medication, social services, and dietary. How much do you pay? Well, the first 20 days, you pay nothing under the Medicare system as long as you need the level of services that Medicare requires. Case 21 to 100, it's 157.50 per day, which is $12,600 for a spell of illness. Who covers this? Medicare Supplemental Insurance will be there in a few minutes. After day 100, if you did receive all 100 days, then you're on file to pay. Or you're going to be under Medicaid or long-term care insurance. Because remember, Medicare is not long-term care. Five conditions for home care. Everyone assumes Medicare is going to be the long-term care coverage. It's not true. To get your Medicare home care, you have to be homebound. You have to have skilled care needs on an intermittent basis. Not full-time, but intermittent. It has to be under a care plan, under a doctor. You have to actually see the physician. One vendor I met earlier tonight for the Queens County area, they're starting up this whole thing of um, home or physicians home services. Wonderful in this day and age because most physicians want you to come into their office. They're starting up through the Parker Institute where the physicians will now go out and see people in the community, sort of like the days of old. Phenomenal to happen, but there is some level of home care in the community. It is not full. And it continues on and on. It has to be reviewed every 60 days. So there's a little bit of home care. Now, Medicare Part B. A, as we said, was hospitalization, nursing facility for the most part. Part B, most people know about it for physician services, doctor services. Medicare covers 80%, and the other 20% cost is up to you, the individual, to pay for it. There's outpatient medical and surgical services and supplies. There is some level of home care, the same way you had it with Medicare Part A. There's durable medical equipment, and there's some other basics, such as laboratory services, dialysis, diabetes supplies. This is becoming bigger and bigger within the Medicare world, picking up these charges at this point. Medicare Part B also has some level of preventive services. And by the way, all of these slides, if anyone would like a copy of it, talk to me afterwards, give me your email address, I'll email it to you. You know, this is all available from the Medicare website, 
the Social Security website. Nothing to hide, nothing that's proprietary. This is just telling you about what our government provides at this point. But there is some already preventive services. What is not, though, covered by Medicare Part A and B? Very simple, a bullet in red, long-term custodial <laughs> care. If you're thinking Medicare is going to cover you when you're in a home situation, the aid that comes in for eight hours a day, home limit, 24-7, it's not Medicare. If you think Medicare is going to cover you long-term in a nursing facility, that's not the program for you. That's Medicaid, private pay, or long-term care insurance. Also not covered, routine dental care, dentures, cosmetic, acupuncture, hearing aids and exams for fitting hearing aids, and other things. The Medicare website tells you a lot more. How do you pay for Part B services? Because Part A is covered. Part B says you have a deductible, 147 a year, just to start the coverage of the physicians. You have to meet the deductible. And 20%, as I said before. But in addition to that, there is a monthly fee to get onto the Medicare program. That monthly amount is based upon your income. The chart that we have listed here, it depends if you're single or you're filing a joint tax return. And the contribution that you pay per month, which is all the way on the right side, it increases as, of course, your income increases. When they started doing this based upon your income, as opposed to just a flat amount per person, there was a big uproar in the community by people who had higher levels of income. But if you look at the difference between someone who is less than $85,000 at $104 and someone who's making over $214,000 as a single and it's $335, less than $250 difference. It is not that greater amount of income to be paying on a monthly basis when you consider the level of income that's coming in. But it is an extra cost. But people have to be aware as they get into this. Now, we were saying before, who covers the extra cost when Medicare doesn't? This is what we call Medicare Supplemental Insurance Policies, also called the Medigap Policy. These plans are regulated by the federal government. As a government regulation, they set down the terms. So if you wanted a plan C, you can now go to Blue Cross Blue Shield. You can go to AARP. You can go to GHI. You can go to any company, Mutual of Omaha, and a plan C, you'll always see the same benefits. You want a plan F, which is the highest level of services covered? Any company you go to, plan F is always the same. But now, as a consumer, you're able to shop by cost. So my father, where he lives down in Florida, the least expensive one out there, New York and Florida, is AARP. In New York, they're about $261 a month. When I mentioned that to my father, he was talking with his physicians, and they said, if you take AARP, we're not going to accept you as a patient. And I go, how can they do that? Why? Because down in Florida, the doctors have to fill out the extra paperwork. And they weren't willing to do it, but they were willing to do it if you went to Blue Cross Blue Shield or some of the other providers. So when you go out and you're shopping, it's not just dollars and cents to you always. You may actually want to talk with the physicians you deal with because they may have issues. As an attorney, I go, I don't care if they have an issue. You buy whatever you want. And if you need to do it based upon your income and what you can afford, that's what you do. They're required to do this. But we can't force anyone to take anyone under Medicare or supplemental insurance. The plans vary. As we said, there are standardized contracts. And Medicare supplemental insurance plans do not work with Medicare Advantage plans. Remember, we're talking about Medicare Part A, the hospitalization and the nursing facility. Part B, mostly the physician services. We're going to get a little bit about Part D, which is prescription drug coverage. But there's also Medicare Part C, which is the Advantage plan. This is just a sample chart of the Medigap plans that are available through the federal government. And if you notice by the check marks, not every plan covers everything. So you want to have the most coverage? Look at the line of plan F. There's a check mark up and down the line. You can get the 
most coverage. There's a high deductible plan for people who are willing to pay a little bit more for their policy. But you can do this, as I say, based upon what services you believe that you need and how much you want to be covered. <coughs> Medicare Advantage plans, the Part C. This is run by private companies that are trying to have you like an HMO or a PPO. The concept is you're part of a network. You're going to receive services through their doctors, through their hospitals. You're going to have rehab in their facilities. And it's not going to be the open market as if you were in traditional Medicare with Part A and Part B. Very important distinction, especially for people who travel, solely because once you leave New York with an HMO or a PPO and you get ill just you cross the bridge to New Jersey, you can have your emergency services if you go to a hospital to an emergency room. But if you need simple blood work, don't walk into a doctor's office there and expect Medicare to cover the same way as they will if you have traditional Medicare Part A and Part B. Um, there's all different types of Advantage plans and there's a lot to learn about them. The best thing I say is the Medicare website or talk with an attorney or other counselor who can help you go through them. There are still costs like the Medicare Part B premium. There are also monthly premiums. There are also premiums at the physicians you go to if you go to a hospital. And you always have to compare what's the cost. How much will it cost me to be in this? You can always switch between plans, and I'm just jumping a few because timing-wise, I have to finish by a certain time because we need to keep this moving for everyone. But you can switch plans. If you don't like one Advantage plan, you can switch. There's enrollment periods, and you can drop it if you want. We spoke about a little bit of the prescription drug program, where Medicare is finally coming in. Now, Social Security Basics. Most people are going to get onto Social Security because they worked or they have a spouse that worked. Your eligibility is based upon having at least 40 quarters of work for full benefits. 40 quarters is 10 years. And your amount that you're receiving is based upon the last 35 years, the highest earning years of work. So people say, I'm going to retire early without realizing that their salary could continue to increase over time. They could be hurting themselves by stopping work early. And this is a lot of people in civil service that say, you know, I'll go work some other trade or some other job. Because they're basing it on Social Security from years before when they had their highest earnings, which is horrible. To get to full retirement, it's based upon your age. At this point, we're looking from people born in 43 and beyond who are at 66 years old, and it keeps going higher and higher to people born in 1960 and later who start only getting it at age 67. There is early retirement, though, age 62. Full retirement is the 66 or 67. It used to be 65 for everyone. What happens if you stop working before 62? As I was saying beforehand, you may not be able to get benefits, but it may not grow because it's based upon the average of the 35 years. We give a sample of earnings. Um, what's the benefit of waiting? Real important when people are thinking about do I take Social Security early or not. Just look at the column on the left side. If you were taking it at age 67, because you waited a year, you get an 8% increase in your monthly payment. And see how it increases if you wait up to age 70. And the same on the right side, age 67. Why would someone delay? It could be because they're still working. And they believe that they're healthy enough that it makes sense not to take it up front, but to wait a little bit longer. And for those people, they're going to see a great increase in their Social Security checks. Big difference if you're looking at the ages. If you took it at age 62, one person could get 750. Waiting to 66, 1,000. Waiting to 70, 1,320. Big difference, $600. But you have to realize also, it's eight years. If in your family there is something where it could cause an issue with longevity, then this may not be the right thing for you to do to wait. So where could you live in your retirement? We're having fun. You know, the amount of secure, social security you get, because most of the clientele that I see, 
they're dependent upon Social Security as an income source. The amount that you're going to get depends upon your highest earnings, your spouse. You know, if one spouse dies, the surviving spouse is going to get the higher of the two between the two spouses. The way you may live in the future is really dependent upon when you're going to retire and start collecting. There's a lot more information through Social Security, lots of techniques such as file and suspend, how to play between two spouses. Not something I do in my office, you can call Social Security, but I know with Ari and Shlomo, there are people within their office and their community that they network with that can help you perform some of these calculations. So, that's Medicare, Social Security in a nutshell. If you do have questions, please let me know what the questions are. I know we can't do everything within a 20 minute time frame to start, but we also have the next topic we're gonna to get to. Any questions? Yes, sir. The uh, Medicare premium that you pay, I, I had seen a schedule, I think, on the Medicare website where there was some kind of uh, prescription component also, a premium for that. Well, under, under Part B, it wasn't a Part D uh, prescription well, premium. Going back a little on this, Medicare Part A, there is no premium. It's it's for free based upon the 40 quarters that you have. Right. Medicare Part B is based upon your income with the chart over here. Right, but I still have another column for some kind of prescription premium. Ah, prescription drug plans. So you go to your CVS or Rite Aid, any place, or to the Medicare website. You can choose your own plan. You do it based upon the prescription drugs that you're receiving, and they look at what's called the formulary, which drugs may be covered. And they're going to give you then a list of which plans you may be able to look into and the premiums. Because all of these companies that are Part D prescription drug coverage, they can charge whatever they want. They can go with what's in the marketplace. They can do something else. Okay. So there is no set list by the government. Is that related to Medicare Part D? That is Medicare Part D payment. And whatever plan you choose, that payment can come directly out of your Social Security check the same way that your Medicare Part B will. But the cost is dependent on the plan that you choose. And these are all private companies. It's not the government. Okay. Yes, sir. If you have Blue Cross, let's say GHI, do you need Medicare Part C? You may or may not. What I tell people who are retirees of governmental plans, of union plans, you need to take out the booklet that they give you and compare it to the supplemental Medicare plans. Because every organization, every government entity can choose what it wants to cover. One example I'll give. I had a gentleman who was retired from Chase Bank. His wife went into a facility with a, uh, a ventilator. Medicare covers up to 100 days. His Chase plan, unlike a supplemental Medicare insurance that can cover the day 100, that plan stopped at day 60. So starting from day 60, he was liable for the co-pays. Not knowing what plan you may be under, you have to compare what you receive versus a standardized plan. And if you feel that it's not sufficient, then you need to think about purchasing a supplemental Medicare plan. Now, you may not need to go to the Cadillac of plans like a Plan F. Maybe you can do a Plan C and that's sufficient, then you'll save some dollars of premium there. Okay? Yes, sir. Could somebody switch to Plan F once they're already elderly and already um, in need of care? Yes. You know, so let's say you had a plan A, you're in a hospital. My parents are elderly, they're already... There's not supposed to be any waiting period. Now, if they're in one company, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, that someone else said. They're in Medicare, and they have, and they have the Blue Cross Blue Shield supplement. So let's say they wanted to switch. The company may say, wait until your next annual enrollment. But if you knew one of them was ill and in a facility, Sometimes it pays to just switch to another company, go online, go by phone, sign up for it, and it's supposed to be covered immediately. And now you have two coverages. And if they do cover you, the worst is you paid one month premium that you didn't need. Right, but it works. Okay. Well, thank you everyone very much.
much. I appreciate your listening. And now, Ari and Shlomo, appreciate hearing from you. And by the way, I put on the chair when, in the front when people came in. It's a little desk reference about Medicare and Medicaid premium benefits. When people leave, there's going to be a whole bunch more there if someone didn't get it when they originally came in. If anyone needs a copy of that from this in my presentation, let me know it's easy enough to see how I'm here. Thank you, Stephen. Um, by the way, Stephen's expertise is not only with Medicare and Social Security, it's also with Medicaid and other estate planning issues. It's an excellent attorney. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you for coming here today. And uh, Achiezer has, uh, my name is Shnol Basalian. This is my associate, Ari Turk. Uh, Achiezer asked us to speak about the topic of retirement planning and elder care planning today. And we thought we'd discuss some of the challenges facing retirees today. So I want to see, by getting your input, what do you guys think, retirees, what are some of the challenges they face? Anybody? Come on, guys, you got to wake up here. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think are some challenges retirees are facing today with retirement, when it comes to retirement? Having enough money. Very good. Having enough money. Anything else? Anybody? Yes, preparing them, protecting their assets as much as they can. They're good. Protecting themselves for their children. Protecting their assets as much as they can and also to leave it for their children. Anything else? Anyone else? Any other ideas? So basically, we've kind of put it into five main challenges that retirees face when they want to come to when it comes to retirement. And I'm going to discuss these five main challenges with you. And my associate Ari is going to offer some solutions to these challenges. The first challenge that people face is the cost of living increases in retirement. And what does that mean? Let's make it very simple. If you look at this, I don't know if you can call it a graphic, as I would say. In 1998, $20 could purchase much, much more than you can in 2013. The purchasing power has declined over time. So that's one challenge that retirees face. And if we look at it from the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, food, cost of food has gone up. Cost of utilities and fuels have gone up. Cost of gasoline and motor oil has gone up over time. And exactly when we want to say what is the definition of inflation, it is that your money has less purchasing power over time. That means over time, what you can buy with a certain amount of money you need much more money to buy it with. As this chart shows, about 3% rate of inflation, what you can buy with $500,000, after 20 years, you can buy with $946,000. So that is a very big challenge people face. So what do retirees do? They want to invest their money as much as they can to get a very good return so they can outpace inflation, correct? But then there's another problem they face, and that is market risks. A lot of us had witnessed the, the great market downfall in 2008 and 2009. So what happened? People who, decide, who started to retire at that time, their portfolio took a big hit. But as it took a big hit, they also had, they also had to take out money to be able to live off of. So because of that, even though the market recovered, because they took that big hit early on, their money, you see the yellow line over there, has a much less chance of keeping up with them as it is if you don't have that early loss. So there has to be a way to cushion that loss. The second challenge that retirees face is the possible depletion of retirement assets, as you stated. What's going to happen? Am I going to be able to keep my money for the last thing? And I noticed that there's one main challenge that retirees face. I had this lady who actually retired, and she had a considerable amount of assets in her retirement account. And she, had, she was stuck in a situation that she was scared to spend. She was always worried, am I spending too much? On the other hand, she had a child who was married, who also had grandchildren, and that child was in very desperate need of her help. 
And she was scared of helping out her child because she was worried she does not have enough money for herself. And she was even scared to spend money. She would like forego all of her expenses because she was like, I don't know, I don't know if I have enough money. Until we sat down and we devised this strategy for her to make sure she has enough for herself. And, she, and once you make a strategy, all these things are possible. Another effect is longevity. People are living longer. One of the top concerns, actually, amongst retirees today is, will I outlift my money? And that's because people are living longer and longer, and they're not worried about they're going to have to go back to work. So I think everyone's nightmare is having to go back to work at this point. And they want to avoid that. Another challenge that people face is that, let's just say Reuven is the breadwinner of the family, and Sarah stays at home, and she takes care of the kids. So Reuben will go there and, and make sure he, he has enough retirement assets to retire with. But one thing he doesn't calculate is that most likely his, his wife will outlive him. Does she, is there enough money left for her to live with? Are they leaving enough for their surviving spouse? Will she be able to meet her basic needs? This is another challenge. Challenge number three, effects of taxation on retirement savings. So, what happens? People, as they're accruing their assets for retirement, they're putting more money into their IRAs, more money into their 401ks, more money into their uh, profit sharing plans. And you know what happens? Our clients coming to me now, they're at age 70 and a half, they have to start withdrawing money from these. And they ask me, okay, so can I take this money out? And I'm like, sure. How much can I take out? As much as you want. Okay, but one thing you have to remember, you're going to have to pay taxes on this money you're taking out. And they're shocked. What do you mean? I'm like, yeah, Uncle Sam, no matter what, there's two things you can't avoid. One is death and one is taxes. Unfortunately, as the great saying goes. So you're going to have to pay taxes at some point. It's not going to go without ever being able to pay, take, pay taxes. And they're completely shocked. And not, they don't even realize they're going to have to go maybe into a higher tax bracket. Unfortunately, when people, as their assets are growing for retirement, they don't realize they have to tax diversify. That means they have different pools of money. One pool of money is going to go with tax deferred. Another pool of money may be other off, sometimes paying taxes now, and they're going to have to pay taxes later. And that can also be. So that's what we call tax diversification of your portfolio. Speed bump number four. Expenses to consider in retirement. And that is that another, a lot of people don't realize what kind of expenses they're going to have when they get to retirement. One of the major, major costs, unfortunately, is the cost of health care and custodial care. I had a good friend of mine who his father retired, had considerable amount of assets. He moved to Eretz Yisrael, moved to Yerushalayim. He had an apartment in Yerushalayim, and he retired. And then suddenly he was hit with a chronic health problem. They started using up their mother retirement money. More and more was going towards paying for custodial care in the house because his mom couldn't take care of his father. And it reached a point that they just didn't know what to do anymore. So he called me up after he had gone through dip, speaking to who knows how many different professionals. And he said, it seems to me that the only choice I have now is to do a reverse mortgage. Are you guys familiar with that? A reverse mortgage is basically to say very quickly is that when someone makes a deal with a bank to sell their house when they die to the bank, and the bank gives them money, advances money to them. So obviously, what was my first question to him? What is your mom going to do? What do you mean? Okay, great, now you'll get this money. What is it? He couldn't answer me. He said, I don't know. We are so desperate right now, we don't know what to do. <coughs> so one of the things, those are one of the most anticipated costs. Another one of the unanticipated costs these days is children. 30 years ago, it wasn't the grown children weren't so much responsibility of parents, but today, unfortunately, they become more and more a responsibility of parents to take care of children who they think they don't need to take care of them anymore. And that, unfortunately, still exists today. And challenge number five, expectations versus reality. Most people think that the blue line will be my expenses before retirement, the orange bar is going to be my expenses after retirement. Reality, 
it seems that most, most people, they want to have a li living lifestyle. And as you can see, the blue line is showing the anticipated expenses, and the orange line shows the reality, what it is. And a lot of times, it's even more, if not less, the person's expenses after retirement. Uh, my friend Ari right now would like to come up and offer some solutions to help us with these challenges. No big deal, huh? <laughs> Simple. Win the lottery. <laughs> okay, so let's run through these problems. Hi, I'm Ari. So when I work together, we're financial services, so we try to help people prepare for retirement. The idea is that you work your whole life, so when you retire, you're supposed to be able to sit at home, play with your grandchildren, and enjoy your life. So we like to help people do that. So let me just quickly go through the problems, and I'll show you how, and how it's very important to establish what we're going to discuss here are very general ideas of how, how to deal with these problems. Obviously, every single person needs a customized solution. So the problems were number one, increases. Um, inflation and market risk. Number two, running through your money too quickly. I, meant, I know when someone asked people, that was the first thing someone mentioned, they don't have enough money for retirement. That seems to be the biggest problem. Number three is taxes, making sure that you properly handle your tax deferred vehicles that you had at work, your 401k, 403b, unexpected, unexpected expenses and reality. So let's, let's talk about the solutions. So the first solution is optimizing your retirement portfolio. What does that mean? Many people I meet today in the demographic between 60, 55, 60, 70 are extremely conservative with their retirement money. And the reason is, is because they need it. They save money and they need the money. And so they're, they're, they're leaving a tremendous amount of their money in a safe place, which is very safe as if you need the money tomorrow. But as we discussed with inflation, it carries a tremendous risk. If a person's going to retire, I spoke to someone recently once retired at 62. And as someone pointed out, people could live well up their 90. That's 30 years. So the, the, the fact of not being able to, um, excuse me, catching up myself. <laughs> so optimizing your portfolio means understanding what you're looking to accomplish, to separating the goals of the next 10 years, the next 20, the next 30 years, and creating a good portfolio. So that involves making sure that some of it's conservative and safe and some of it's taking risk. Now, as someone pointed out, risk is scary because of the fact that you could drop and early on. That would be very devastating. So part of the planning we do with people is creating types of insurance policies which allow people to invest in the market with principal protection. And that's something that's not, that cannot cover the scope of this conversation. Number two, okay, minimizing income taxes. So a lot of people save money and it's a great thing. I just put away $5,500 in my 401k this year. It's great. I get, I'm single, so I'm in a very high tax bracket. So I got to save some of the money. The problem is that when you retire, so some different perks have different rules, but let's say you have to take all your money out. So if you go ahead and save a half a million, a million dollars, and just pull it out, you're going to have to do income taxes on the whole thing. So rule number one is you roll over your 401k into an individual retirement account, an IRA. And now you control it. When you have an IRA, it's your individual account. It's not it's your work anymore. You pick the funds. You pick everything. You decide everything. You withdraw it at a stable rate. Now, as Solo mentioned, part of that is also tax diversification. Today, we're living in a historically low tax environment. In 20 years from now, I mean, with the debt as high as it is, and with the fact that we're historically low, it's pretty, most people consider the fact that taxes will considerably go up. Saving money in a tax-free bucket, which involves other strategies, is very important so that you have two. So, for example, if someone needs to put $100,000 a year to live, and all of it's coming from a taxable account, that's not as advantageous as pulling 50 from a taxable account and 50 from a non-taxable account. Um, so that's how a person would strategize as far as taxes is concerned. Now let's talk about longevity and how that affects, there's two areas where longevity affects people. Number one is running out of money. And number two is, it's a beautiful thing, people are living longer. And that's wonderful. But the problem is, is that people may be living longer with chronic conditions. And they may not be having the full quality of life. I know my grandmother, for example, has uh, turned 92 recently. And she's been living in my home for 10 years um, on 24-hour care. She does not need medical care. She needs assistance with daily living. That's walking, eating, going to the bathroom. And so she has... So that, that's, a, that's a very significant problem. That's what we refer to as unexpected costs in retirement. So other things go down, like tuition, maybe some taxes, but medical expenses or expenses, I want to clear, clearly establish, as like uh, Stephen Cass said, 
Mr. Kent said, um, there's Medicare, which think of it as like health insurance. Yeah, that's the next slide. Medicare, think of it as health insurance. Doctors, hospitals, skilled facilities. I'm talking about regular, old-fashioned frailty. If you're 90 years old, most people are frail. And frailty oftentimes comes with need of assistance. And so therefore, we need to analyze products that can help a person repair. Why is that important? Because if you don't, you'll likely be spending all of your retirement income at that point on the care you need. Um, my grandmother costs about $100,000 a year in the, the care just to have two Hungarian aides that speak Hungarian and play Hungarian games with her and make her Hungarian food. That's what she likes, and, that's, and, and therefore, she has a product that provides for her to get the things she needs. That's what long-term care products do. It protects assets and income. So like we mentioned, we have a plan. We're going to have money in retirement, and that money is going to be set aside for food, utilities, things that we need. If we need to spend that on something else, how are we going to live? So a product of long-term care planning protects your assets and income. It also gives you quality and choice. My grandmother had an aide. She didn't like her. Well, she didn't fire her. She has Alzheimer's. We fired her. Now, there, now we got two people, Judith and Sophie, who speak Hungarian. And she, she appreciates them. She enjoys them. It's, it's called quality and choice. And the other important thing that's not monetary is emotional. The fact is, is that usually one daughter, your oldest daughter, is going to probably take care of her parents. And the sons will call up on our shops and say good job. Yeah. And ask if you need any help. And then maybe we'll send money, maybe not. So there's, there's a real, there's emotional and financial concerns. The financial concerns are, it's extremely costly. It, 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 we're not even talking about a nursing home. We're talking about staying at home and just talk, talk. Most people I meet are scared of losing their autonomy. They're scared of being in fact, forcing to rely on their children, having to rely on their children. And that's exactly where long-term care solutions come into effect. Creating your autonomy, protecting you from having to rely on your children, and giving you quality and choice of care. Now, leaving a spouse behind to be discussed is a problem because if the, there's not a fixed income that's going to cover expenses, that creates a challenge. So let's go to, right, longevity risk. I forgot the slide, excuse me. So what is it saying? Basically, if you live till 85, you probably live past 90. That's a long time. You retire at 65, you might live till 95, that's 30 years. Going back to what we discussed before with inflation, we show that 20 years, you take a $20 loaf of the grocery market, you're getting maybe a loaf of bread and a, a, a bottle of milk. And 20 years or 15 years ago, you were filling that up. I don't know where they were shopping, because I, I, I'm not that young. I remember 20 years ago, but I guess kosher, not kosher, or whatever. But the point is, is that longevity has another risk, which is basically outliving your money. So here's the solution, ready? We have to do, what I do with my clients is I divide with them, there are two things, there are, there are fixed expenses, I'm talking things that they need to survive, food, utilities, basic shoppers, basic expenses. For basic expenses, we go into what's called a guaranteed income for life. We take a part of their money and we create a plan that guarantees no matter when they die, 110, them and their wife will get a check for the amount of money that they need to cover their fixed expenses. With the rest of their portfolio, we try to manage strategically to how we can help them grow it possibly to do extras, maybe like vacations or gifts for your grandchildren. So I hope um, it's up to you. And uh, I hope that was informative. And the basic idea is these are general ideas. Obviously, every person is different. How much someone's going to rely on Social Security or not, how much, whether long-term care is the best solution or other solutions are the best solution. That's why we're all here together to create a, an open a discussion to be able to help with whatever, whatever questions you have. Um, I'm going to open the floor if anyone has any questions. And if I can answer, I'm going to make sure I'm answer. <laughs> anyone have any questions? Yes. Long-term care. I'm going to go into the next session at seven o'clock. Sure. More about Medicaid. Yeah. But uh, I mean, isn't it generally like the goal to be able to qualify for, for Medicaid to, uh, so as not to have to resort to, say, long-term care insurance? And, and I'm going to let Stephen address that because he's he's uh, handles that more. What are we trying to do? Well, I will tell you, as an elder law attorney, I've been yeah. doing this for over 21 years. Medicaid sometimes becomes the option when someone has failed to plan otherwise. 
That's the best way to say it. A lot of Medicaid situations are based upon people who come in and they realize that there is a higher cost of long-term care. They decided, maybe at the last second, that they would like to preserve something for their children. Because people don't come in at 60 years old and go, you know, I'm nearing retirement at 65. How can I give away all my money right now so I can be ready for Medicaid when I'm 80? That's not what happens. And if you're saying, well, there's a five-year rule, something you'll learn in the next session, I will say, where is the crystal ball that anyone has to tell you when to start your planning five years in advance? And Medicaid does not cover everything you may want. You're fighting with them sometimes. Now, with an insurance product, a long-term care insurance, that could cover enough dollars per day to cover the limit for a 24-7 stay, that's guaranteed. You know that's there as a benefit for you. Versus Medicaid, they may not feel that you need the same level of care. So Medicaid is not always, but that's something that we go through if someone feels it's appropriate for them. And asset protection-wise, don't always expect to save 100% of your assets. It depends what your situation is. Right. So I just wanted to point, uh, elaborate, drop on that, is that long-term an insurance product, it's like anything else. When Medicaid is a government program, so it's a, it's a program that's run by the government, and long-term care insurance is a policy that you pick to, to choose on your own. So your choices and your quality of choices are much greater. It's you, up to you. You get, you're creating a plan, there's a, there's a service, it's not up to your children to, figure, to go through the labyrinth and figure out what's happening and how to do it. So, and also there's many different types of products. So the, app, the, the, the truth is each person needs to be spoke, and get to, I need to get to know them on a personal basis to figure out whether this is the right way for them or the other way is the right way. And generally speaking, when I get to, when we speak, we, it, it's pretty easily comes out whether, whether which is the right way for a person to go. But really, there's, it's really the, the people that uh, most benefited going one way don't really cross over into the area people most benefited going the other way. Any, anybody else? I address all of yes. I, I have a, a question. I have a, a friend. My husband got his letter for retirement at the like age of 62. I said, go for it. <laughs> um, we have a friend who is going to be 70 years old, was not born in the country, came to the country, uh, got his green card, lost it. Okay, never got his citizenship, but lost his green card, lost his social security, lost, lost everything that he needed. He has the number somewhere. Can he get Medicaid? Uh, sorry, can he get Social Security retirement benefits? Do you know what documents? I know I, I went through the list of what documents he has to bring. He basically has to show his residency. Well, first of all, you get your Social Security based upon the quarters that you put in here. Right. There are a lot of people who are on the system who have resident alien cards and green cards. To replace a card, very simple, call Medicare or, Medi or Social Security. Well, I'm, what I'm thinking is I think Social Security actually might have the actual number when they gave out the card. Well, Maybe they got the A number in over there. But, but you can ask for a replacement card. Yeah. 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 But there are government agencies in. I know for Social Security and Medicare, the number to call for that. The green card, I, that, I don't deal with the immigration issues, so I can't tell you which number to call, but it can be obtained. Okay. Yes, uh, question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question. Oh. If, if, if the goal is preservation of assets for children, for inheritance purposes, rather than providing yourself with enough funds to, to care for yourself for long-term care, isn't it less expensive to, let's say, use up your own money and then just buy a life insurance policy or have life insurance policy for the kids? more cost-efficient than buying long-term care in order to preserve your assets for your children? Well, it really depends on your personal situation. Depends how much income you have. Depends. We also have to know how long will you be, will you need to go to a facility? Will you need medical attention? How long? How much? What will the cost be in 20 years now? I mean, the real answer is that sometimes that is a strategy. I, I've uh, been, I, I wasn't my client, but I was associated with someone who was dealing with someone who decided to go ahead and do exactly what you said. He said, I'm not dealing with those risks. I'd rather guarantee my children $3 million no matter what. Three kids, a million each. <laughs> Whatever happens to me, they can't go after them. I don't actually know that. We have to ask Stephen. Um, but uh, let's say I'm going to guarantee two million, uh, million to each of my kids, and that's what I'm going to do. So it really depends. There are too many unknowns. So the answer is you have to know the person. You have to know their finances. You have to know their comfort with risk. You have to know how old they are, what their family history is. I mean, there's a really... It's, it's, I'm saying then you sort of, in essence, blow through your own money, and then at that point, you can be able to But there's... Uh, so let's say there are multiple plans to use when trying
trying to say you want to uh, pass assets on to your family. Which is the right solution? It depends upon you and your situation. You may have income now to pay for the life insurance policy, but when one of my clients' mother with her million dollar policy, that was her plan, she's in her mid-80s and the premium had risen up to $60,000 a year. And unbeknownst to the son, she had virtually drained her assets to cover this $1 million plan. They came to me, I learned of it, because she was looking for Medicaid because she couldn't afford anything else. And the son says, what do I do? I go, well, can you afford $60,000 a year? What's your mom's life expectancy? You tell me she's going to live for 10 years. You put 600000 in to get a million. But what could you have done with that 60000 per year and as the premium increases? So there's a lot of factors, and it is a great option, and it works for some situations, but not everyone. Yeah, I have a client who we helped him with his estate planning. He was worth about $15 million. And we managed to remove a lot of his assets out of his estate. Right now, he's sitting with about $2 million in the bank, and he has an income of about $500,000 a year. So I'm just giving you a very... He has Parkinson's, and he's not eligible to get any kind of long-term care insurance. Unfortunately, he's, he's a great Parkinson's patient in the sense that I have... My father-in-law has Parkinson's, and I know how debilitating the disease is. He's in very good shape, and he's in his upper 70s right now. He has that money. I keep on telling him, any penny right now you have in the bank is going to be taxed at considerable amounts, both federal and on the state level. But he has, he's, wants to hold on to that cash just to be able to get, just to be able to pay for it, just in case he has long-term care expenses, to be able to pay for it. And at the same time, knowingly that that 40, uh, could be close to more than 40% of that money that he leaves over is going to be going to Uncle Sam and not to his children. So it all depends, on, as they said, it all depends on your situation. Okay, anyone else? All right, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for everything.